Hello, everyone. It is May 1st, and we are back with another episode of Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen, and welcome to a very interesting topic this month. I'm lucky enough to where I don't feel like I'm a part of this subject. (laughs) Might be in the future, though. Shout out to all of my kids' husbands and wives. Yeah, that's that's an early (laughs) shout out. I I think you can wait for a while. (laughs) Do you really think in, uh, I mean, how old are your kids? Oh, way too young. Yeah, yeah. But I get crazier as I age, so I feel like it might be it might be a good idea to go ahead and start preventative measures soon. Do you think that someone that's dating one of your children is going to check the social media on their soon-to-be mother-in-law? You never know. You never know. And if they you do, never know. <laughs> I hope they don't find out that you're a murdering mother-in-law. <laughs> which is today's topic. But before we get to that, we have a couple of other things to touch on. Uh, We know that we've been talking to you guys about using the code for CrimeCon. We have now heard back from CrimeCon and they're telling us that many more people used our code than uh, the number of people that have contacted us about the first 10. So we wanna put a quick reminder out there. If you want to come to the first 10 event, which quite honestly at this point, we're okay rolling past 10 people if there's more of you out there, uh, be sure to send an email to crimeaftercrime at lordenarts.com. And that's L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S.com. We want to make sure to hear from you guys so we can plan to have you there, so we can make sure you get a cool shirt, a goodie Mm -hmm. bag with all the stuff that we're intending on giving the first 10 group. Um, And a big thank you to everyone that used the coupon code. We really, really appreciate that. So if you want to hang out with us, be sure to get that email in because we only heard from, I think, seven people. Yeah, I think it was about seven. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and we're hearing the numbers actually quite a bit larger from crime con so we don't want you guys to miss out and uh or we don't want you to show up and say hey where's my stuff and we're like oh we didn't yeah. know so please help us out send us that email all right uh you can also reach out to us on the twitter account at crime after pod and if you want to vote on today's episode if you can get there for the first seven days after this episode has aired you can put in a vote there and i'll make it really easy just go there and look for the thing that says john and just click on that And then you guys can also vote on YouTube. You can click the video at any time and the letter I will appear in one of the corners of the screen. Once you hit that, you guys can go ahead and pick who brought the best story. Or just now, pick, or just pick John. <clears throat> yeah, or just pick John. I'll support. I mean, I always pick John. <laughs> I always pick Danielle. That's what I do. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but. Well, here we are to talk about the last episode. It's that time. Voting results with Danielle for the world's worst alibi. You guys, I wasn't sure how this was going to go. I hadn't checked anything until John and I sat down today. But on Twitter, 58% of you voted for me and 42% of you guys voted for John. That's pretty close. That's Mm -hmm. probably one of the closest we've ever been. Yeah, I think so. But then on YouTube, 74% of you guys voted for me and 25% to John, meaning I have the coffee mug. Absolutely, coffee mug is going over <laughs> to Danielle. There it no. is. Oh wait, <laughs> how's it? It's on both sides at the same time. Try it again. Yeah, that Quick. was that was totally terrible. <laughs> there we go. Oh no, it's still bad. <laughs> that, you know, I think the audience finally caught on to the fact that we actually have two separate coffee mugs, Danielle. But I'm honestly actually impressed though because we've done such a good job in the past that some people did think that we actually sent it. So I'm impressed. Magic. Well, but, do know that I don't use the coffee mug when I for the month that I lose. I seriously, it goes up in the in the cabinet and it stays this there. It's serious. It stays there. It is it's in really timeout serious. until we do some more research. Yeah. Now on the flip side, when I win, oh, uh, that sucker is out every day. I'm looking at it on the desk. Yeah. Yeah. When you win it, you enjoy it. But yeah. we're tied now. Yeah, for totals overall, mm. absolutely. That means that for the eight episodes of Crime After Crime that there's been before this one, four of those went to Danielle. Four of them went to me. Uh, I did have my streak where I think I had three yeah. in a row. That was a rough time for me. Well, you might be <laughs> on it because you're two in a row now. So if you get today's episode too. You'll be matching that streak. I'm really curious to see how this is going to come out at uh, the end of year one, which I can't believe is coming up so quick. All right, everyone. It is time for us to talk about 
murdering mother-in-laws. Um, interestingly, I kind of bumped into my story fairly easy, but when I did research on this, it did look like a very narrow topic. Did you find that also? Absolutely. I don't know why I was expecting to run into a lot more stories than I did, but I kept seeing the same ones over and over again, and everything was really brutal. Yeah, yeah. The there's few some, that I did find. There's some very dark stories, and I actually kept running into much more instances of someone that murdered a mother-in-law. That was kind of hard with this search. Yeah, yeah. See, I think I actually only ran into a few of those. Yeah. But, Well, thankfully. Man. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of people have strong feelings <clears throat> about in-laws in general. Um, because Mother's Day is this month, we decided to focus on the mother-in-law, frequent butt of many jokes. Yes, very um, much so. Yeah, and a lot of <laughs> uh, hard feelings for some people. Let me just put out right now, my... It's weird saying this, my current mother-in-law, but I have been married before, but uh, my current mother-in-law, amazing. Oh, Absolutely mine is as love well. her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I Got love very her. lucky. We go on vacations together. We have a good time together. She's also kind of a drinking buddy of mine whenever we get together. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, I, thankfully, this doesn't necessarily apply to me, but I have some information from psychologytoday.com. And in marriage counseling sessions, often in-laws are brought up. The biggest complaint is that the uh, couple's in-laws are intrusive and controlling. When questioned further, it turns out that mothers-in-law are perceived as the main culprits. Many may have had difficulty coping with the empty nest syndrome. Others disapprove of the people their children chose to marry, and others are just lonely. <clears throat> but couples may unconsciously provoke in-laws into the very behavior they claim to hate to their own detriment. See, um, this is this is what I'm saying. This is why I'm nervous for myself in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm telling you, as a mother myself, it can be difficult. I mean, even when your children are young, you're very very protective, and when you know just that for so long, right? And then to see them leave the nest, and especially you know maybe with a son, and watching your son, you know, love their wife, and all of a sudden you aren't the most important woman all the time. You know, it's I can. I can see how this is a huge issue. That rings very true uh, in the story that I'm going to cover today. Um, but you're you're also touching on something that I don't know if you've experienced this yet because of how young your children are. But what about the dynamic of them bringing friends in and you recognizing that those friends aren't the best type of friends for them to have? Oh, absolutely. You know, even at a young age, especially with my daughter. There have been a handful of times where, you know, I've taken her out to a public place, maybe to a playground or, you know, she goes to the gym daycare a lot. And obviously you love your child. You want them to, you know, have the best, surround themselves with the best people. But whoo boy, there yeah. have been a handful of times where I'm like, you, <laughs> mommy says no hanging out with her anymore. <laughs> Let's not do that anymore. Um, yeah, it's it definitely still happens. Very, yeah. very young. So you're going to be so. dealing with like microcosms <clears throat> of this issue all yes. through their adolescence yes. into their teens. And then at some point they're going to decide to marry someone. And it's it's like a coin flip, right? <laughs> if it's going to be and, someone in that category or someone that you can appreciate. Oh, yeah. And my daughter, I mean, she's only five, but she's like got a thing for all the bad guys and all the movies already when we watch like superhero things. And I'm like, this is going to be a disaster. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> She's a she's a wild one. She's a firecracker and really, she's already oh yeah, looking she, at the bad boys. Yes, she and she's always like, oh, does he ride a motorcycle? And I'm like, you are five. I need you to calm down. You're giving your mother a heart attack, okay? And when you get older, please grow out of this. Oh my goodness! I think we just need to change the whole topic of today and continue down this conversation. Uh, this is fascinating to me. Were you someone that was attracted to the bad boy when you were younger? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. I mean, yeah, I remember being her age and I always loved like the scary bad guy characters in all the movies that my dad watched. Really? And then I was a mess. And you know, oh yeah. So, oh geez. I mean, I kind of had a thing for a scary bad guy character. I was really into Freddy Krueger when I was a kid. I literally yeah. had pictures of Freddy and posters and I'd even mm -hmm. got, get like the cardboard standees at video stores. They would give me the Freddy Krueger ones and I'd take them home and put them up. <laughs> But in secret, it was partly because I was terrified of him that I had his oh, images yeah. all over the place. I yep. thought that if he ever came into my room, he'd be like, oh, this kid's cool with me. I'm yeah, going to leave him alone. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> 
So anyone that's worried about Freddy Krueger, that's that's how you uh, take care of it. Just worship the guy and have him all over the place in case he comes in. Perfect. Um, all right. So, Danielle, I think it's that time. Let's get to your story about a murdering mother-in-law. Okay. So Heather and Steven Stroop, they were a couple from Georgia, and they were in the middle of a very nasty divorce and custody battle in 2009. Divorces obviously are never easy, especially when children are involved, and sometimes very desperate measures are taken, even the deadly kind. Now, we already said, in-laws can already be a little bit, a little bit of a touchy subject. Once you get a divorce involved, it can get even stickier. So Heather and Steven had an 18-month-old son named Carson that they shared custody of. And during the divorce, Heather and Steven would swap Carson over per their arrangement and a public place. This is a pretty typical situation to ensure no outbursts or, you know, make sure there's an easy handover. But on April 26th, things did not go according to plan. Steven had Carson for a bit and planned to head out to hand him over to Heather. And they met at a Target parking lot in Snellville, Georgia, around 6 p.m. that day. And the handover originally went pretty well. Steven handed Carson over and drove off while Heather remained in the parking lot strapping Carson into his car seat. But within moments, a man walked up to Heather, put a gun to her head, and murdered her in front of her 18-month-old son. Whoa. And I know you're hearing that, and you're like, wait a minute, this is mother-in-law. Just wait. Okay. The perpetrator ran off around the Target to a hotel parking lot and sped off in a white pickup truck. Authorities were absolutely dumbfounded, and they tried to get as many eyewitness statements as they possibly could to figure out who on earth would commit such a crime. So they first decided to check into surveillance footage, and they almost immediately realized that this person was wearing a wig and a fake mustache at an attempt to conceal their identity. It appeared as if it was a man wearing khaki pants and a tucked in shirt, but now they weren't really so sure. Through speaking to witnesses, some believed that Heather absolutely recognized the person that had killed her. Witnesses claimed that as Heather strapped Carson in, this person in this wig and fake mustache walked up to her, and they had actually seen this person kind of lingering in the parking lot kind of staring at, you know, the handover, but was keeping their distance. And this person stood out because of how obvious it was that they were in a disguise. Everyone described it as a horrible attempt at a Sonny and Cher costume. And this is like in 2008, 2009. I mean, like a a giant Afro style wig. I mean, it was very obvious. So when this person walked up to Heather, they actually spoke to each other for a minute and Heather looked very shocked and alarmed Uh, and she quickly actually tried to get into the driver's side door the perpetrator slammed it shut heather actually screamed for help to a passing driver but in that same moment the person pulled out a handgun from a bag and shot her point blank and then ran off Hmm. so authorities started to wonder if maybe the handover of carson had something to do with this if there was someone that maybe wanted heather out of the picture A handful of people were aware about the drop-off location, and since this person seemed to be waiting just out of sight, it became obvious it was a planned or at least a targeted attack. So they went all the typical routes. They questioned Stephen, her ex-husband, and then they set their eyes on a woman named Joanna Hayes, which is Stephen's mother. At their initial interview with her, she admitted that she did not like Heather because she said Heather was an unfit mother. She claimed that she didn't change Carson's diapers frequently enough, that she never washed under his nails. She made it very clear that she did not approve of her. And based on the current divorce situation, Heather was pretty much heading towards having full custody of Carson. Hmm. Yeah, so other than not liking Heather, they also found a few other reasons to suspect that Joanna was possibly involved. So authorities had received a phone call from someone staying at the nearby hotel, and this person was reporting suspicious activity. The day before Heather's murder and the day of, a person in a strange wig and a mustache drove to a target area and was taking pictures. And when the driver saw this witness watching, they sped off fast enough that their tires were squealing, like made a huge thing of it. So the witness said this person was driving a white truck, and guess who else owned a white truck? Mm -hmm. Joanna Hayes. So within two days of Heather's murder, they drove the witness to Joanna Street, and Joanna's car was confirmed to be the car seen at the Target. Upon further questioning, Joanna told authorities that there's no way she could have been involved because she was at Home Depot with Stephen, her son, at 5 p.m. that day. And then between 5.15 and 5.30, she actually headed off to see her parents. She said that she stopped at a Wendy's for a Frosty, and she could provide a receipt. It was still in her truck, and that would prove that there was no way. 
Authorities, however, didn't believe her, and instead of just taking the receipt, they took the entire truck for forensic testing. Good. Yeah, exactly. I think they were very fast on their feet. Yeah. So they were able to refine the receipt, but it was definitely not for the time that she had stated. It showed that she did not arrive at Wendy's until 7.19 p.m. that night. So they decided they were going to retrace her footsteps. They left the Target around 6 p.m., the same time as the murder. They drove straight to the Wendy's, went the exact same route, used the exact same speed limits. And sure enough, they arrived at 719. Wow. Meaning there was absolutely no way that she had headed straight to Wendy's at 515 that day, but instead after leaving the crime scene. But still, this wasn't enough to arrest or charge Joanna. So after the forensic testing was done, they were able to find that there was gunshot residue on the steering wheel and the dashboard. But unfortunately, they couldn't prove where exactly it came from. I saw a bunch of talk about it maybe coming from a car battery or a nail gun. And she worked at a construction site. So, you know, that easily could explain it. They also found dark fibers that appeared to be consistent with the wig used, but they were never able to confirm. Yeah. So authorities tried to go a different route, and they decided to bring Stephen in to show him the footage of the possible suspect, and they captured his reaction on video. It was obvious from the second the video started, he knew who this person was, and it was confirmed through a recorded phone call made shortly after. Stephen immediately called his mom and was hysterical. The second she answered, he told his mom he saw the footage of the suspect and that it looked just like her, walked just like her, and he specifically asked, why did you do it? <sighs> now, Joanne repeatedly denied having any involvement, but Stephen very obviously felt she was the one in the video. Eight months after Heather was killed, Joanna was arrested and charged with her murder. Now, prosecutors were running with the idea that Joanna didn't want Heather to gain custody of Carson. Right. She wanted Stephen or herself to have custody of the son, so that was pretty much the motive of the crime. And she'd even spoken to an inmate while awaiting her trial, telling them that Heather was going to get full custody and that it would tear the family apart, and she was not going to allow that. She was a very religious person, and she said that God wouldn't want that. Uh, she even specifically told the inmate that she shot Heather in between the eyes. But the defense said that authorities had tunnel vision and never considered any other idea and that they were just trying to pin her because it was the easiest you know, way to get a charge. Sure. Stephen, however, even changed his stance and said that authorities actually forced him into believing it was his mom. So their rock solid thing they were really holding on to totally turned around. He claimed that while he was being shown the security footage that authorities repeatedly told him it's her, isn't it? And eventually it broke him down so much that he became confused and he said authorities basically tricked him into questioning everything his mother had ever done. But someone else close to Joanna and Stephen disagreed and said that he now was just covering for his mom. So a friend that attended the same church, this woman spent three to four nights a week at Joanna's house. Mm -hmm. She saw the surveillance footage on the news and immediately recognized and disguised this person as Joanna. So while on trial, you know, she expressed this and she also said that Joanna was a very controlling person and that Heather had spoken about being scared of her during the divorce, saying that she didn't physically feel safe and her exact words were, I don't know if Joanna would try to hurt me or not. And then another kicker, one of Joanna's ex-husbands even came on stand to testify that she had put a gun to his head 20 years earlier, the exact same way she had to Heather. They were in the middle of their own divorce, and when he didn't pack his belongings up fast enough, she pulled a gun on him and threatened him. Wow. Oh yeah, so this wasn't the first time she had kind of gone towards this, and it, it gets even crazier. Plenty of Heather's friends also came on the stand. They said that Stephen's family was acting crazy about the divorce, that Heather you know, verbalized this to a lot of people, and there was even talk that Stephen had already signed papers agreeing to give Heather custody of their son. So this would have really ticked his mom off. Mm -hmm. But according to them as well, his mom always had it out for Heather. Even before they started dating, he didn't approve of her, didn't want anything to do with it, and things basically just got worse once they were married and were due to have a son. Now, during the trial, one of the great ways they were really able to pin this was a former coworker of Joanna's testified that Joanna spoke about a year earlier on Valentine's Day of how she would commit the perfect murder. <laughs> oh, yeah. So she gave away all her secrets about a year prior. She, wow. Oh, yeah. She spoke about buying unregistered guns from construction sites. She claimed that she had already bought about three, that it was an easy way to do it. She said she always bought revolvers because they didn't jam and there would be a lot less room for error. 
Wow. Oh, yeah. She said that she had a shop behind her house, and in the shop she had plenty of tools that would allow her to destroy the gun. More specifically, she planned on melting it and then tossing it into a lake. She even went on to how she would create an alibi. She told this coworker that as long as someone used a credit card linked to her at the right time, far enough away from the crime, there would be no way she could be linked to it. And she even said that she had a few cars she could choose from. She specifically stated she wouldn't use her minivan because it would be too recognizable and that she would more than likely use her truck. So she basically had already planned this murder a year prior. Why and do you tell someone all out. this? It, I just you I don't already get it. failed at your perfect murder by yeah. giving everyone the information. Wow. She ended up being found guilty of murder, aggravated assault, possession of a firearm, and after three days of deliberation, she was sentenced to life in prison with possibility of parole when she's 77 years old. Ooh. But to this day, she still strongly defends her innocence. Steven says there's absolutely no way that his mom would have killed his ex-wife, uh, but Heather's mom absolutely believes it had to have been Joanna. She actually now has custody of Carson and has made it very clear that if Joanna were to ever somehow make it out of jail, the first thing she would do would be find them and do the exact same thing she did to Heather. Right. She, uh, Joanna did attempt to fight for an appeal in 2013. That did not go well for her. Um, and actually, the 35 caliber handgun that was used still has not been found. I'm mm. sure it's melted in a lake somewhere, according to her plan that she gave everyone about a year prior. Amazing. Amazing. And it, it's weird because it also sounds like, despite the fact that there's all these indicators, it sounds like it was a largely circumstantial case. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And even the jury deliberations going on that long sounds like they were having trouble coming to a firm determination on that. Yep, and I was looking at the different court records for it. I mean, and I was hoping to get, you know, what sort of physical evidence did right. they have? And I couldn't find anything. I couldn't confirm if, you know, they ever, again, you know, the fiber that was found in the car, if that did match the wig. I mean, it, it was. It was a whole bunch. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah it, it's a bunch really of solid. circumstances, yeah, a bunch ultimately. Of circumstantial evidence. Yeah. Uh, now, when <clears throat> the sun was shown the video and had the reaction at that point yes. did he tell the police that he thought it was his mother or did he not tell them anything waited till he got home and then called her and they had her tapped um i wasn't able to find too much information on that because i was wondering the exact same thing yeah. from some of the information that i read it seemed as if he did alert authorities that he believed it was his mother yeah, um, yeah. that's just from the information that i saw but then um, it, again, it was not very clear in the court documents. Right. They almost made it seem like he, after the fact, went and they had no idea. Um, but wow, yeah. they yeah. said his. They said they recorded his reaction though, and his face kind of said it all. So I don't know if maybe that's their ass assuming them assuming basically that. Yeah, and I don't think they would talk about it that way if he came <laughs> yeah. out and literally said, you know, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's my mom, or wow, that looks a lot like my mom. I think that comment would have come out in the media instead oh, of yeah. you know we were recording him and he had this reaction where it, it looked obvious that he recognized. Uh, and to think about it from his perspective, you know, she's going to go to jail over this. Um, I think this is something that we see in family dynamics kind of regularly where it's already bad enough um, that one person is gone, you know, yeah. from his perspective. And, and maybe he wasn't in love with her anymore. I mean, they're going through a divorce. But, you know, admittedly, the, the mother of his child is now gone. Yeah. And now his mother is potentially being taken away as well. Is it really that hard to think that his perspective on this would be, no, she's innocent, you know, or that he yep. would at least be stating that? Uh, if he actually believes it or not, I think it could be a question. Yeah. But wow, wow. Just a terrible crime, though, to <laughs> kill her. And, and, and it's, it sounds like it was obvious that she wanted to um, say something about it, that she actually wanted her to know. Oh, yeah. That she was going to do this to her. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the witness statement said that there was there was a brief argument. You know, yeah. there. I mean, very, very brief, but immediately Heather knew. Yeah. And there, she tried to get away. She knew. You know what I mean? She asked for help before yeah. she even knew a gun was there. Yeah. I think oh. it's heartbreaking. Yeah. And it really speaks to <clears throat> that she must have said something. She must have told her, you oh, know, yeah. you've, you've been a problem. And I said, there was some type of interaction there mm -hmm. that made it obvious. 
Wow. And then the premeditation, I mean, she showed up before, was taking pictures of all of the Target parking lot. I mean, still in the exact same yeah. <laughs> get up. I mean, and then at that point, what on earth is the point of the disguise? Well, and for someone that's premeditating things to that level, yeah, I wouldn't choose a Target parking lot. You've nope. got a lot of people there. You've got video surveillance there. There's just a lot that's going on there. Um, you know, not that I want to put out how I would commit the, the perfect crime, but... Uh, <laughs> I'll watch you in a year, John. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and I'm, I'm also wondering that with her. Like, I wonder if when she was talking about this to her friend at work, if it was in fantasy scenario at that point. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and then as things progressed with the case and the fact that her grandchild might have been, you know, the custody might have been taken away, then things moved from fantasy into, okay, I'm going to take action on this. Exactly. And wow. you know, I mean, but that one mess up though actually is what ended up solving the case, her deciding a target parking lot because they had, from yeah. what I've seen, absolutely nothing else other than, I mean, multiple different witness statements. I haven't seen so many witness statements in any case I've ever covered. Yeah. I mean, she went out of busy time in the middle of the parking lot, so... Whew. Yeah. I can only imagine if it had been somewhere else, they might not have ever been able to pin her to it. It, it honestly sounds like it, it was a tough case, even with the information yeah. that they had. I mean, when you don't have the murder weapon and, you know, you can't tie the fibers, even the gunshot residue stuff, yeah. that doesn't necessarily prove that it happened from that particular shooting. Exactly. You know, there could have been something at uh, some other time where a weapon was discharged in the vehicle. Or I, I would I would assume, I guess, that it was transference from her. That yeah. the gunshot residue was on her and then she transferred it to the interior yep. of the vehicle. But even that doesn't necessarily prove. I mean, if she's a woman that knows how to shoot weapons, she might have, you know, gunshot oh. residue that's on her at other yeah. times. So, wow, wow. Well, that is a good one, Danielle. I think you are once again in good standing. You might be going for the three-peat. <clears throat> we'll see. <laughs> I don't know. You've got a look on your face this time. Oh, I <laughs> always have nervous. that look. <laughs> I, I always have. You have to fake confidence, Danielle. When you're fake in it this game. You make it. I say it all the time. <laughs> I say that in the gym when I know I'm doing something very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yep. When you're in this game, you got to fake it. All right. Um, all right. Let's go ahead. Let's go on with uh, my story. Not too dissimilar, I think. Uh, we're, we're definitely going to see some some things lining up between our stories here. Uh, it seems like a mother's love for her son is an important factor in both mm -hmm. of these. The Los Angeles Times refers to Elizabeth Ann Duncan, also known in the media as Ma Duncan. Oh, as the boy. worst mother-in-law in California. You seem like you're familiar with her. Have you heard this name before? Oh, absolutely. I don't know I don't know a lot of the details. I just have seen a video that I think you might might get into later. This woman <laughs> is she's a character. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not only does the Los Angeles Times refer to her as the worst mother-in-law in California, the Oakland Tribune calls her one of the most amazing women in criminal history. Interesting way to put it. Yeah, seriously. Very Espe interesting. Especially when you hear this story. Let's get into it. Ma Duncan was living in Long Beach with her six children in 1948. The trauma of losing her youngest daughter, Patsy Ann, to a spontaneous cerebral hemorrhage at the age of 15 seemed to push Ma over the edge. For the next 10 years, she wrote bad checks, used multiple aliases, and got married to somewhere between 10 and 20 different men. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And she didn't bother to divorce one man before marrying another. She even served 30 days in, a, in jail in San Francisco for running a brothel. And at this point, this is a woman that's in her 40s, approaching her 50s. Uh, now nearing her 50s, she even married one of her son's classmates from law school, lying to him about her age and promising they could have a child together. That's an aspect of this story that's really interesting. I mean, this is a woman that is 50 years old, and she's convincing a guy that's in his mid to late 20s that, um, you know, they, they can have a kid together. I don't know if she, I mean, I've seen pictures of her. I don't think that she had a particularly youthful appearance. No. Uh, especially because most of the photos are from, you know, the trial. So they're, they're even a number of years after this. But uh, apparently she was a heck of a storyteller, knew how to, knew how to pull people's chains. 
Uh, Mama's little boy, as she liked to call him, Frank, finished law school and was living in Santa Barbara, California. This is her son now, not, not her husband. She eventually ditched that guy. In 1957, Ma Duncan moved in with her son, Frank, and he agreed to help clean up the legal mess of her multiple marriages that she left in her devastating wake of broken hearts. Oh my gosh. Uh, she eventually decided that she didn't want the help and refused to cooperate with him. Her son then ordered her to move out, and Ma responded by taking an overdose of sleeping pills. Frank went to make sure that his mother was packing and found her unconscious. She survives the ordeal. However, all of this started an unimaginable chain of events that would push Ma even further past the limits of human decency that she so often ignored. While she was recuperating from the sleeping pill overdose, her son Frank was getting to know the nurse that was taking care of his mother. Olga Kupchik was a 30-year-old woman from Canada, and very soon, Olga and Frank were dating. Ma Duncan was not happy with any of this. Frank was her little boy, and she didn't want some other woman coming into the picture. Despite Ma's feelings, in June of 1958, Frank and Olga were married. Frank told his mother, who went into hysterics. It was so bad, Frank decided that he would try to live with both women. He would spend the evenings over at Olga's apartment, but then go home to the apartment that he shared with his mother and sleep there. He told people, I felt like a yo-yo, bouncing back and forth between two women. Despite this living arrangement, it wasn't long before Olga was pregnant. Now, some of you out there might be wondering, and I do just want to address this, I couldn't find anything specifically to say that this was occurring, but there are rumors going on that the relationship between Ma and Frank might have been somewhat inappropriate. Oh, buddy, just when I thought this story couldn't get any any more wild yeah and i don't I, like i said i don't know if that's yeah. true or not but what's <laughs> clearly true is her attachment to frank is way beyond you know way beyond normal oh yeah so oh yeah um, but frank's wife olga gets pregnant still living somewhere else by the way i mean i mean he's kind of living there he's going and visiting her and then going home to you know where his mother is ma duncan would wait until frank left for work each morning and then she worked on trying to scare Olga out of town and out of Frank's life. She would call Olga and even show up at her apartment threatening her. Olga told friends and family that she feared for her life and the life of her unborn baby. She even tried moving to different apartments, but Ma would keep showing up. Olga tried to talk to Frank about what was happening, but Frank just wouldn't believe it. He told Olga that he did speak to his mother about it, but his mother told him none of it was true. Olga stayed in the relationship and in town, so Ma had to up the game. She bought a gun and threatened to kill herself. Frank took the gun away. Ma decided to try to invalidate their marriage. She showed up in court saying that she was Olga, and she paid a stranger to go in there with her saying he was Patrick. Um, and uh, Patrick's actually the middle name, Frank Patrick. Uh, it seems that this actually worked. You're kidding me. No. She went in and basically got an annulment with a guy that she paid to say <laughs> that she was Olga and he was her son. So she couldn't even successfully end pretty much any of her own marriages on right, her own. Right. But <laughs> she sure can she sure can end that one real can, quick. Can you imagine that? Couldn't couldn't divorce any of the ten to twenty guys, but got her son annulled, got her son's marriage annulled. Um, oh my goodness. With complete fraud. Uh, yeah, I couldn't believe, and it, I wasn't sure because in some articles they really didn't address if the annulment actually went through or not, but it did. <laughs> oh my gosh, John. Um, but what what did that do? You know, it, it still didn't get rid of her core problem. Olga was still there, and I don't think Frank and Olga even knew about the annulment. So she continued. She started offering money to people to help her kill Olga. In one instance, she offered $1,500 to a car hop and she wanted the car hop to throw acid in Olga's face and push her off a cliff. The car hop told her son Frank what his mother had requested, but once again, Frank spoke to her about it and Ma denied it, so he didn't believe anything was going on. Of course, Ma did not stop there. This woman is like persistent in the dictionary, should have a picture of Ma Duncan. I mean, oh, she, just, she just keeps going, keeps going, keeps up in the game. 
uh, she found two men through an acquaintance that were willing to work out a deal. Luis Moya and Augustine Baldano were willing to get rid of Olga. Ma agreed to pay $3,000 when it was done and another $3,000 within six months. She pawned some jewelry, stole some cash from her son's wallet, and gave them about $355 to cover the initial expenses. And for the expenses, these guys were like renting a car from a friend of theirs for $25. They borrowed a gun from someone. Uh, the plan was that they were supposed to kill Olga and take her body to Tijuana. But let's see what happened. Tuesday, November 18th, 1958, Olga, now seven months pregnant, opens her door to a man that she's never met before. He tells her that he's a friend of Frank's and that Frank is drunk and passed out in the back seat of his car. Olga rushes out in her bathrobe and slippers, and as she gets close to the vehicle, she's pushed into the car. She tries to fight back, but one of the men pistol whipped her so hard, the borrowed gun actually broke. Her body was left at the Casitas Dam construction site just outside of Ojai. So essentially what happened was one guy went and did the ruse to get her out to the yeah. car. Another guy was in the back of the car, um, kind of acting like he was Frank until they got the door open and then they, they took her in from there. Uh, the car they realized would not get to Tijuana. I mean, this $25 car that they, they borrowed from a friend. So uh, they decided to change the game up and that they were going to bury her, you yeah. know, not um, in the immediate area, but closer. And apparently these guys were such geniuses. They got to this spot and neither one of them had a shovel. So they oh, wound good up. Oh, grief. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, my so, goodness. So they wound up like digging an area out by hand. And I don't know how much of this detail I want to go into, but she wasn't dead yet. So I was one about of them, to ask that. Yeah. One of them would go over and be strangling her while the other was digging out by hand. And they would actually switch positions over and over and over until they thought she was dead. In truth, she wasn't dead. Uh, the coroner found that there was dirt in her lungs. So she was essentially buried alive. Um, terrible, terrible, terrible way to go. But let's see if justice can arrive in this case. Uh, Luis and Augustine would be arrested just a few weeks later, but not related to the murder of Olga. This made Ma Duncan extremely nervous. What if they spilled her secret? She decided to try to use her son to get them in deeper trouble. So she tells Frank at this point that the two men were blackmailing her about that annulment scheme that she had pulled off earlier. Frank goes to the police, trying to get these guys in trouble for blackmailing his mom, but he didn't find the support that he was expecting. Instead, the police were focused on the question of where exactly was Olga? And they confirmed that Ma Duncan had illegally obtained an annulment of Patrick and Olga's marriage. The police pressed Luis and Augustine for more info and learned that Olga had indeed been killed, where her body was, and that it was paid for by Ma Duncan. The two men also said that if they knew that Olga was pregnant, they wouldn't have killed her. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, she's seven months pregnant. I was about to say, at seven months pregnant, you can you can tell that someone's pregnant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd be very surprised if, if they couldn't realize that. But admittedly, these guys aren't geniuses. These are guys yeah. in their, you know... Um, early to mid 20s and you know they're taking 335 dollars essentially to start oh. this whole wacky scheme for yeah. getting mm -hmm. uh, even even this aspect i mean they essentially open up to the cops I, i've seen two different versions of this story one of them says that a uh, pastor in the jail was able to get them to talk other versions say that the cops actually went to them and they wound up talking but both of them essentially admitted to it in what was then called the trial of the century, long before the O.J. Simpson case, Patrick would once again go to bat for his mother in a very big way. Oh, he you got to be kidding. Yeah, seriously. He would not only take the witness stand and downplay his mother's actions, he was also contributing at the attorney's table. The defense would wind up calling only two witnesses, Patrick and Ma Duncan. When asked if his mother tried to break up their marriage, he replied, Let's just say she hindered its development. Ma Duncan would deny knowing anything about the crime. However, after 44 witnesses were called by the prosecution. You said you heard a lot of witnesses in your case. You just blew that out of the water. <laughs> 44 like witnesses. Like way out of the water. <laughs> including 
the two actual hitmen. So oh. Luis and Augustine actually take the stand as well. She was found guilty of first degree murder after less than five hours of jury deliberations. Ma Duncan was sentenced to be executed. Patrick would continue filing appeals and doing whatever he could to try to save his mother. While this was going on, the two hitmen were also sentenced to death. They somehow got a hold of some hacksaw blades and sawed through the bars, beat up two security guards and held them hostage trying to get out. Eventually they fired in a bunch of tear gas and that shut down their escape plans and they were pulled back into custody. Is As there like no level of self-preservation in these guys? Like there seems to be a complete disconnect with it's weird. what you should and shouldn't do in life. Yeah, it's like these two guys are like comedy characters that have been written into this really tragic, dark story of Ma Duncan. Yeah, it's really odd. Everything they touch, it's just, it has this goofy feel to it. But uh, as, the, as Ma Duncan sat in prison, uh, Frank actually got remarried to an attorney. Uh, however, they would get divorced sometime later. Wednesday, August 8th, 1962, after three years, numerous appeals, and a last-ditch effort on Frank Patrick's part that actually kept him from seeing his mother's final moments, Ma Duncan was walked into a gas chamber. Her final words were, where's Frank? I'm innocent. Ma Duncan is the first woman from Ventura County and the last woman to be executed in the state of California. Three hours later, her two accomplices met the same fate. Oh, wow. Now, I didn't even write this in, but once again, these two guys walk into the gas chamber laughing and joking with each other. Are you serious? Yes. No, 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 no. I'm totally serious. It is. I've never seen that description before. They're literally and they're They're sat next to each other when this is happening. And they're just kind of shooting, shooting the breeze and, and laughing with each other. I mean, wow. Uh, I'm, ca- I'm, yeah. Again, I don't even know what to say about that. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, and there's this weird aspect where they didn't get anything for their testimony. They essentially That's... made this whole case and allowed the prosecution to be able to really pin it on Ma Duncan. Um, but there was n- there was no benefit for them. It's not like the death penalty got taken off the table. It didn't help them in the processing of their case. So once again, it's just like, I don't know where these guys are coming from, but all <sighs> the just actions don't just... Don't seem to care about pretty much anything. <laughs> it's, yeah, right up until their literal you know last exactly. moments. So California does still legally have a death penalty. However, their last execution of a man took place in 2006. Out of the 744 people currently sitting on death row, only 22 of them are women. And I want to give a big thank you to the LA Times who wrote a great article about all this and helped me get a jump start on this. Um, But yeah, with the executions in California, they've run into this kind of sticky thing where the... um, the injection method has been seen as possibly inhumane if it's not done properly. Yeah. So they have now made a requirement that it has to be administered by a medical professional, but there's no medical professional that's willing to go and give someone an injection to kill them. It's kind of no. against the Hippocratic it goes against, Oath. Yeah, exactly. It goes against everything they're you know standing for. Yeah. So essentially, there's no way for them to process executions at this point, and it keeps kind of getting batted back. Uh, the current governor there has also put a moratorium on executions as of March 2019. Yeah, so. I remember that happening. Yeah. Oh my goodness. She, the, I think probably the most frustrating thing about this entire story is that there were an absurd amount of times that she likely could have been stopped. Yeah. I mean, all across the board. Yeah. It's very difficult when you lose someone, when you lose a child. I almost, I don't want to say feel bad for her, but I wish someone would have stepped in to get her the mental help that she very likely needed in that situation because it seemed like she just really snowballed after that yeah the recklessness is clear i mean she just absolutely she really kind of threw her life into the wind and there's this other weird aspect that at least in the way that this story comes together she uses men a lot absolutely but when it comes to her son it's a whole different thing it's like the only person that she ever truly loved in terms of, of a man was her son That's exactly the same vibe that I got. And, you know, when speaking about Frank directly as well, Mm -hmm. 
it's very shocking to me his reaction yeah you know this is so, this is an attorney you know what i mean this yeah. is someone you expect to be incredibly intelligent and with it and in touch with reality and i find it very interesting that if you put someone like that in a situation where again as we spoke about families involved lines kind of get blurred and he really stuck up for her and i mean i don't understand he had his first child yeah. murdered and he didn't seem to really well, connect those dots and then he immediately went into another marriage i mean thankfully ma duncan was in jail at that point i know, <laughs> you, know, I know. you know who knows what would have happened can to you her. imagine marrying that guy and like learning oh what's going on with your mom oh wait she's in you know she's on death row right now for what for yeah <laughs> my other wife by the way yeah uh, i don't know how you could even get into that relationship um yeah, yeah, it, it is a, a, a really kind of dark thing. But once again, I think it points back to that whole idea of he had lost his wife, he had lost yeah. his child. The only thing he has left for that point in is terms of family mom. is his mom. And, you know, who knows what his upbringing was like, considering what, you know, her attachment level to him at this point is. So exactly. all that conditioning and kind of pre-programming that goes in, I mean, who knows? Um yeah, it's it's a crazy, crazy story. Really blew my mind, and I can see that took you for a little little bit of a wild ride too. What do you think of Ma Duncan now? <laughs> Honestly, in like the first couple of sentences, I was already absolutely shocked at what kind of a human she was kind of panning out to be. But I mean, she was relentless, absolutely yeah. relentless. Yeah. And I, again, I think that's what makes me so shocked that no one kind of stepped in beforehand because it's, I mean, it's uh, it's one thing for her to kind of trick her son, but for people on the outside to not do something sooner, yeah. again, is just very, very shocking to me and hard for me to wrap my head around because it wasn't just small, simple things. She was showing up right, and threatening her, you know, threatening Olga and multiple times saying all sorts of crazy things threatening to kill herself just i mean oh yeah and she was like brilliant with it like she would go and, absolutely. and like lie to the landlord to get into the apartment building so that she can go and harass olga more i mean yeah it's master manipulation yeah and it's that's part of what kind of breaks my heart about it like think yeah. of what she could have accomplished if she had such a skill set in terms of dealing with people that if she was a good person with those skills, wow. Exactly. She might have been someone amazing. And just that drive, you know, when she's focused on something, <laughs> she just won't let it go. <laughs> exactly. I know. Will not, yeah. will not let it go. But unfortunately, wow. it was just in a very unhealthy direction. So, well, as usual, we did look for other stories, but we didn't want to continue talking about murdering mother-in-laws necessarily. So we just looked for some additional tidbits about mother-in-laws in general. We're going to celebrate Mother's Day <laughs> even further with some uh, different stories here. So I bumped into one from Ireland, and this happened just last year. Uh, a man claimed that he was going to send his wife a bill for the costs of accommodating her exceptionally difficult and disruptive mother. <laughs> I'm sorry, your mom's too difficult for my time in agony. I'm going to need like at least a couple thousand dollars. Yeah, I'm going to send you a bill. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I, I need to try that at some point. I need to write a bill up for my wife <laughs> and have it like mail it, like do the whole thing. Actually shows up in the mail in an envelope. <laughs> Uh, yeah, his wife actually, or his mother-in-law actually walked into uh, the master bedroom in her underwear, uh, rearranged his clothes, and even walked into the ensuite bathroom right off the master bedroom uh, while he was drying himself off from a shower. Uh, she pulled out plants and shrubs that she didn't like that were around the house and threw them in the trash, costing him about 900 euros to replace them. But he got really mad when he was watching a concert on Christmas night and she busted in complaining about the noise. This is a quote from him. But the thing is, she's a guest in my house. She cannot, I'm sorry, she cannot be allowed to raise her voice at me and tell me what I can watch and can't watch on television. I'm sorry. Well, if she can do that, there then is something awfully wrong with our society. <laughs> oh, good grief. I mean, just put yourself in this position for a minute. Could you ever imagine doing that to somebody? Which I mean, part of it? 
walking in. I know. (laughs) Every single dang bit of it. Every single one. Honestly, I don't blame him for billing her. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I kind of don't blame him, too. Uh, And it's interesting because this actually was like being presented in a court and the judge was kind of like, you know, just be nice to your wife. And and the judge was making it sound like the marriage wasn't doing too great. And this was just oh, geez. another aspect of it, you know, of, of a way of him lashing out at his wife in some way, which is oh. kind of interesting. There's, I mean, you could, I'm sure, maybe not an episode of Crime After Crime, but I'm sure someone could do a whole analysis on how mother-in-laws are used in arguments that are actually between the married couple, um, which is, I think, what we have a little bit of in yep. this case. Danielle has some quotes about mother-in-laws that she wants to share with us. Well, these are actually personal stories. Okay. About about nightmare things mothers have done. Okay. You know, and I mean, what's unfortunate is actually when I was looking into other stories, there are so many that are similar. Yeah. <laughs> that it's very, very alarming. <laughs> There's one story. This woman's husband had been married prior to their marriage. And apparently, the mother-in-law refused to let his ex-wife go. She directly told her new daughter-in-law that his first wife was, and I quote, there before she was. So she would always have a place in their family and would always come first. She even kept all of his old wedding photos up from his previous wife, would not take them down and refused to put up new photographs with his new wife. Wow. And the ex-wife was also invited to all of their family functions. Wow. And the number of times that I actually saw this same type of story yeah. is incredibly alarming. I saw another, another one in particular. The mother-in-law would constantly bring up her son's ex-wife in front of the new wife and be like, by the way, She's single now and like wink at him and say she's looking for something special. (laughs) Meanwhile, the new wife is just sitting right there having to listen to all of that. Yeah, that's tough. That's really, really tough. You know, I'm and I'm someone that's that's been married twice. I've I've had my different stories in terms of, you know, how I feel about in-laws or even my own parents and how they deal with, you know, me coming out of one marriage and going into another. There's, it's, it's just a minefield for strange feelings to pop up and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And it's just, it's sad because ultimately, especially for the first story you talked about, you'd like to think that the, the mother would actually support where her son was now and what was important to him now. You know, not necessarily try to hold on to the past of, hey, we really liked it better when he was married to this other woman. And, But I, I do also get that, you know, I mean, marriage marriages can go on for a long time. We have no idea how tight those yep. relationships could have developed. And I understand, you know, that you don't want to let people go necessarily or push them away specifically maybe because they're not married to your son anymore. But I think there's a cool way to do it and kind of handle that, you know? Oh, absolutely. And it, it got so bad that they actually ended up getting divorced and oh. he remarried. So now I wonder if that wife is now dealing with. Right, right. Both yeah. the previous ones. Yeah, yeah. I, like I can the two only imagine before what she better. might be going before. I, can, I know, which is a total lie, first of all. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Maybe right. it's maybe it's the same situation. She just doesn't want her son to be married. Do you think his, his maybe mother Maybe it's a Ma Duncan thing going on here. Yeah. Does, does his mother have a ranking board? And she's like, okay, wife number three, you're going into position number two. <laughs> wife number one, you're still on top. You're still doing great, honey. Wow. <laughs> wow. Just the judgment. Well, that is not the craziest of the stories. I've got one more to share with you guys. This one is from Australia. I got it from news.com.au, and it's from February 2019. I caught my mother-in-law messing with my birth control is the name of the article. Couple, there's a couple, uh, they decide that they don't want kids, just not part of their game plan, right? And the mother-in-law is upset that their family name is going to end if they don't have any children. So she offers to come over one day and make dinner. She gets there and the wife isn't home yet. And she tells her son, hey, I'm missing something for this dinner. Will you run out and buy this missing ingredient? While he's gone, the wife comes home. She heads upstairs to change out of her work clothes, walks into her own bedroom and finds the mother-in-law in there poking holes in their condoms. Here's a quote from the woman that found her mother-in-law. She snaps her head in my direction with this mortifying deer-in-the-headlights look on her face, like a fish out of water. 
She mumbles something about how she's trying to save the family and frantically runs out of the house before I even have a chance to say anything. The mother-in-law is so freaked out by being caught. She actually runs right out, gets in her car, and this woman is kind of following after her. She almost ran over the woman's foot while she was driving away. Now, after this all happens, of course, the woman talks to her husband and they recall, hey, you know what? Wasn't mom over here just a few weeks ago, too? And, you know, she was in the bathroom for a while. Do you remember that? Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. (laughs) Guess what? Weeks later, they confirm she is pregnant. So the mother-in-law did it on more than one occasion, did poke the holes in the condoms, and now this woman's having a baby. I would lose my marbles. Yeah. Like, yeah. absolutely lose my marbles. What is it with mother-in-laws? Moms get crazy. <laughs> I've said this before. I've, I have remember saying this a couple episodes ago. Moms can get a little bit wild Yeah. over their children. and You remember this, Danielle. Yeah, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to be as Take sane notes. as possible down my path of motherhood. <laughs> right. I'm hoping it all goes in the right direction. But yeah, learn from. I'm this. telling you, it is this like instinct, and I'm. Yeah. It's well, I mean, terrifying. You want what's best for your kids, right? And you're trying to. I don't want to say like you're you're not pushing your ideas on them, but you're taking oh, yeah. the lessons that you have from life and you're trying to instill those in into them and you're trying to guide them along the way. But at some point, you know, your kids become adults and they have to take that steering wheel themselves and decide where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And I think there's at, at that point that some mothers have trouble letting go and deciding, yes. you know, you saying that just gave me anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good sign or if that's something normal, but... Yeah. Danielle, at some point, you're going to have to let go. But for you, it's not going to happen for a long, long time. But remember these stories. I want you to save this episode. I'm going to have to call you and be like, John, I need some help. I'm freaking out right now. Well, let's see. By the time you call me for that, I'm going to be in my mid-50s, and I probably won't remember much of anything. No. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get it. I get where it comes from. It's just... It's sad that some of these things play out this way. That instance is really bizarre because you know despite the fact that she didn't her and her husband didn't want to have children she also doesn't feel like she can end the pregnancy so oh absolutely i mean what do you immediately, do at this point? immediately an uh, incredibly difficult situation she probably never yeah. ever envisioned herself having to be in right but what's so again so frightening about this is i'm actually very happy there weren't more cases you know along this more serious lines that we were on but the number of cases like this that i ran into just yeah. very small things where mother-in-laws have just overstepped boundaries and i mean they do not care yeah they do it and they're for the most part very proud of themselves <laughs> <laughs> so it's that's a little bit frightening yep no wonder there's this giant stigma yeah, yeah. It's all making sense. <laughs> I don't think it's going away anytime soon. <laughs> no, all, absolutely not. All we can not. do is have these conversations and hopefully learn a little something from them. So, what do you think this month? Who do you think? Who do you guys think is going to win? I already know what my vote is. I already tell you guys all the time. But genuinely, John, that was a really great, great story. I mean, Thank from you. start well, from start to finish, her character development <laughs> is just. <laughs> absolutely wild you know that's what always what hooks me i i always get hooked when i'm looking into a story and if i get a really good sense about the person's personality from their actions and yeah i felt that on this one if i ever see a racehorse named ma duncan you can bet i'm putting money on that racehorse that horse is not gonna give up yeah ever but your story also i think is very important to talk about nowadays. I think there's a lot of situations like that that come up. Um, You know, I was a a kid from a divorced family. I remember the exchanges. It's usually at a, you know, Target parking lot or McDonald's somewhere or something like that. And um, there's, there's a lot of times where we've talked about cases where sometimes grandparents have a bit of an overbearing control about their, their grandchildren. And I think that's a really important aspect of your story that needs to be highlighted and uh, more people need to be aware of and, and talk about that. Exactly. And, you know, 
I find it interesting too that yours actually did also involve a grandchildren. It's mm-hmm. almost like this triggering thing that just kind of trickles down and yeah. creates a disaster. Um, yeah. So I'm. I don't know. I don't know. They're well, both very similar stories. Yeah. Well, Ma can, Duncan's just a, a little, a little bit crazy. Uh, she is. She is. She's a character. <laughs> a little bit crazy. <laughs> Uh, continuing on this trend, and since in June we will experience Father's Day, our topic for the next episode of Crime After Crime is disorderly dads. How are you feeling about be, that? That one's going to be an interesting one. I'm actually pretty excited because, I mean, you know, the mother-in-laws, the women, they kind of do some crazy things. But I feel like when the dads get mad enough to do something disorderly and crazy... There's probably something ridiculous backing it. So I'm, I'm very interested to see what I stumble across in my research. I am too, and I, I like that it's so wide. Exactly. It's a very wide topic, so it's going to be interesting to see what type of stories. I know you and I, we, we kind of share a brain sometimes, so I'm curious to see if we bring similar stories uh, or if we're going to have some differences that we're looking at. But disorderly dads, and we were considering putting the word drunk in there, but we don't want to actually hold it to that. But I will say that if I find a drunk disorderly dad story, it's okay to include those as well, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. All right. Because I'm sure, again, it'll be absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> I'm sure it will. <laughs> Although, I don't know. Ma Duncan might take it. I don't know. <laughs> If you guys want to find more from John and I, we both have YouTube channels and we are on social media. You can find me on YouTube at Daniel Hallen. You can search it. I should pop up right away. And that is my at symbol as well across all social media platforms. Yep. And you can find me at Lord and Arts, L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S, or you can just search Lord and Arts on YouTube or search Brain Scratch or search Searchlight. There's all kinds of different ways to find <laughs> me. If you want to submit ideas for future episodes of Crime After Crime, please send an email to crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com or reach out on our Twitter account at crimeafterpod. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And we want to take a minute, as always, to thank our patrons. They are the ones who allow us to have limited ads on YouTube and no ads at all on audio. And our patrons get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. John and I have talked about so many different topics, and you guys are also you know, more than able to send in topics you want to hear from us. You get to know us a little bit better. We've got some crazy stories under our belt. I'd say a lot better. That's one of the more intimate <laughs> yeah. shows I think that I do anywhere. So yeah, we get into all kinds of stories from our past and childhood and ask interesting questions of each other. So yeah, yep. you probably don't want to miss it. If you're a fan of Crime After Crime, you could do it for as little as a buck a month. Jump onto the Patreon, get those extra episodes, spend some more time with us and let's hang out. And on top of that, we also give our patrons a personal shout out in our Patreon special. So if you're a new Patreon, we are going to probably say your name wrong, Yep. (laughs) but we will try and we will still say it. We will stick through and attempt it. (laughs) A for effort. We will always try. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. We need help growing and we cannot do that without you and your amazing reviews. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone about Crime After Crime. And don't forget as well to stop at our merch store. You guys can check all of our items out there at teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime. And on that note, I want to wish you guys an amazing Mother's Day. Don't go out there and do anything wild. I'm begging you. Be nice to your (laughs) mother-in-laws. And we will see you guys next time on Crime After Crime. Bye-bye.